computer and then just kick us the file when we're done. How do I kick you the file? It'll, as soon as it's done, it's going to say converting and it'll give you a status bar and then it'll open a folder and it has your file in it. And then just drop it in the shred drive? Yeah, wherever you want, however you want to get it to us. But it's going to be hecka big, dude. Uh, it'll be a good size. <laughs> you, or you can just upload it to. Uh, I'm recording this one. <laughs> Why is our cloud full? Clear it up. Because it can only hold like a couple, like a couple gigs at most. Even that is, I think I want to be one. Thank you. Right, hold on one second. All right, who's who's facing uh, multiple offers and struggling to get things accepted? Right here. <laughs> okay, so I'm gonna um, share a screen here, and we're gonna start our presentation. Can everyone see that? Yes. Okay. Excellent. So um, we'll make this somewhat interactive, but we'll we'll see what I can do. So I'm gonna talk about steps to steps to win multiple offer situations. So when you're talking about multiple offers, we're also gonna details on how to write offers and things like that to make it successful. But a lot of it is is um, a lot of success that I've had in the past. I I've I can tell you I've won and against 21 other offers not being the highest. I've won over 17 offers not being the highest. I've won over eight offers not being the highest. So there's ways to do it. And um, so it's sort of a comprehensive thing. And it's about establishing a relationship, a good relationship with your buyer, establishing a good relationship with the listing agent as well. Um, and if you can, and, and trying to negotiate. So let's talk about that. So um, I, I recommend, and I'm going to start here just with, if, if a lot of you are struggling with buyers who don't uh, want to write good offers initially um, or don't uh, understand, they want to come in at list price, why would I go over or what, what mindset is, and I'm saying you're not, then you're not doing the proper steps up front with your buyer to have them in the right mindset for the market you're in. And, and, and you need to under, they need to understand that. You need to understand prices are, are, you know, the average list price to sell price right now is 101%. So on average on uh, list in across Sacramento, 101%, that means on average sellers are getting 1% more than they actually list the home at. So you, you need to show that to your clients. Um, and and the, the best way to do that is do a buyer's consultation. I know a lot of us skip the buyer consult part saying, oh, why would they do that? But it's a real way to you. I use it a lot to create to add value to the to add value. Um, I always try to add to make it more sexy. Um, to make it more sexy for uh, for the buyer consult because a lot of people tell me, "Hey, you know, the buyer consult it's not sexy enough. They don't want to do it." So I always try to try to tie it to the loan process. So I always say, "Hey, look, um, my lender will." 
you know, apply online. My lender, you can bring your docs in. We'll scan them in. We'll send them to the lender. You can get pre-approved right there over the phone or maybe their lender's in-house so you can get pre-approved right there. And then we'll sit down and talk about the loan process, right? So, um, and then, um, and I don't even call it a buyer consultation. I just say it's a meeting that we have to have to get you pre-approved and just before we can show homes, right? And so that way the buyers just expect it, right? The goals is establish rapport and find motivation. And I know this is about, I know this is about um, getting offers accepted, but I can't tell you, um, I've done a lot where I've done good negotiating and the buyers won't go with me. Like I say, hey, you gotta be 15,000 above, but we can win, just write this, I'm writing this uh, addendum, we can counter this and we'll win and they won't go with me. And then I realized, I need to get the buyers with me before I negotiate on their behalf. So establish rapport, find the motivation, dig deeper, right? Because you got to find out what they really want. Discover what they're really looking for. That way, when you the best way to get your buyers really on board is to make sure that they really want the house and you know they want it. And then you can check in on the motivations. You can see objections. If they're, if they're going to eject a house, you want to know. If they're going to balk at, at, balk at um, you know, uh, uh, making a higher offer for certain reasons. You need to know those ahead of time, right? And then um, you got to establish realistic expectations for homes. So I, I show buyers like, hey, average home price, average list price, right now, sellers are getting 101% of list price. Does that make sense? So that means we're going to have to offer over list price on most homes to get accepted. Are you okay with that, right? So and I establish some of those mindsets. So, um, why do you, some of the motivation questions you should be asking, why do you want to move? What home ownership will mean to you? How will you feel if you made this move? You want them to feel the process, feel that motivation, because that's what you're going to use when you ask them to bid 15,000 over. Hey, look, you really told me you wanted, a, a, you know, bigger rooms for your kids in a big backyard so they could pay safely in your backyard. And this is the only home we've seen that meets those criteria. And I can tell you, it's going to be 20,000 more than you were thinking. Now, I know you can still afford it, but I, you know, it's more than you're thinking, but I think it, it's really meeting what your family's looking for, right? You need to know those motivations that will help them offer more. It'll make them, uh, you know, make that decision to pursue the house stronger, right? And discover what they're really working for, get the vitals. So, um, um, just so you know, you're going to get common objections that they, 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 they're, you got a lot of objections, like, are they worried about the market turning and crashing? They worried about co coronavirus, things like that. You got to have ways you can counter that to buyers as well. So you got to, you got to understand, acknowledge their concern. I totally understand that concern. I never want to put you in a bad financial situation. So just acknowledge that, that fear. Um, if you were to buy this house, how long would you stay in it likely? Most people stay at seven to nine years. When you talk to buyers, they often overestimate that. They're going to say 10, 15 years often when they're looking at a house, right? And then you can say, look, we've had eight to 10% appreciation this year. We're projecting that. Here's why we have sellers are down because of COVID. That means we don't have enough sellers. Rates are low because the government is pushing them low. And now we're going to have, uh, you know, uh, um, we're going to have more appreciation than expected next year at a rate of most people are anticipating eight to 10% next year. So if anything is going to get more expensive for you in the short term, it's definitely going to, you know, and markets go up and down, but the average market in California goes up and down every seven to nine years. That means we go up and then we go down. So if you're planning to live in your home longer than seven to nine years, don't worry. Even if you go down, as long as you can make the payment, when it comes back up, it'll be higher the next time and you can sell then. Right. So take the fear out of a lot of people, right? Um, and if you want to use other people like Zillow or something to, to that predict appreciation, they like it when third party sources that they feel are, are valid, validate that, validate your comments, right? Anything, um, I, I would establish realistic expectations during your, your buyer consult. What does that mean? I literally search for homes that they're looking for on Metrolist. So I put Metrolist on the screen in the conference room and if they say something like, I want a five bedroom, three bath home with a bedroom and bathroom downstairs, and I want to do it in North Natomas, and I want it for $500,000, right? Or I want it for $400,000. What are they all going to say? You, you know, that's not true. And then you're going to try to blow them up and say, hey, that's not true. 
Rather than you say it, let MetroList say it. Let the market say it. I literally put up MetroList and I say, hey, look, let's search for that. Five bedroom, three baths, one bedroom downstairs, bedroom bathroom downstairs, under 400,000, zero. Right? <laughs> Nothing comes up. No, no fines. I was like, sorry, there's no, They're like, well, I saw one, you know, a few months ago. And then I go here, I'll go back. And I go in the solds and I say sold one year back at the same criteria. And I pull up all the solds and one comes up and say, oh yeah, that's the one. I said, okay, let's look at it. And it's like a total fixer, you know, foundation issue. That's why it was low priced or something like that. I said, would you buy this house right now if it was on the market? They're like, hell no, that's a foundation issue. I go, the only reason it's in your price range is because it has a foundation issue or a, it is a fixer, right? And so then I go, look, there's nothing within the last year that meets your criteria. So, you know, and I, I tell them I don't operate in Disneyland, right? I don't, I don't like that. That's not me. I'm here to help you find a home. So either we got a compromised neighborhood or we got a compromised quality of our size of the home, or we're going to have to compromise, or you're going to have to, you know, spend more than you want, right? So, you know, push your approval higher, right? If you can, right? So uh, and make sure pricing is correct. Just so you guys know, if there's a rule of thumb, $600 is about the payment for every 100,000 borrowed right now. And that's in our low rate. So if you think they're buying a $400,000 house, you're totally talking $2,400 uh, as a payment for that house. Does that make sense? All right. Oops. Um, establish expectations. Um, showing speed. And this, is, and this is important in this kind of market. You, you got to let them know that houses go quickly. That means when I show you a home that is a potential home for you, we don't say, hey, we want to see it next weekend. We say, we say you ought to see it within the next 24 hours. Is that an issue for you? You got to set expectations correctly, right? And then you got to tell them how you like to negotiate. This is important. I, I said, look, I'm going to be aggressive. If you're going to be in this market to buy a home and you want, and you're in a, even if you're in a first time home buyer market, you're going to have to be aggressive, multiple offers. Okay. How I like to be aggressive. I'm going to be a bulldog. I'm going to fight for you, but here's how it's going to work. I'm going to engage the other side in, in a negotiation strategy, even with multiple offers. And my goal is to get you the number. That means I'm the number in terms. That means I'm going to come back to you and say, if you want to win, you have to be here. And then it's up to you if you want to go there. But just so you know, I'm going to come to you and it's going to be more likely than the list price. And it's probably going to be a little more than you want to spend. <laughs> but that's what it's going to take to win. But my goal is to find you the home that you're willing to do that for. If I find you the perfect home, would you willing to do that? Yeah. Okay, great. That's my goal. Right? I tell them that. That way I set the expectations correctly that that I'm going to, I'm going to ask for more money to get you accepted, right? You want to, and that's at the buyer console. So now I'm telling them way ahead of time. Does that make sense? And if they have issues, they'll, they'll start talking to you about, it. is that okay? You have issues with that, right? Um, and, and sometimes if they do, they'll tell you and that way you can work it out right there, right? How do you like to work? What's your valuation? What's your response times? Who's searching for properties? You got to, you got to get those things worked out. In this market, especially now, in an easier market where it's more balanced, yeah, you can take your time. It's slower, um, you know. But right now, if you don't set expectations with your buyers up front, and they go write offers, and you write, say, say for example, you have buyers, and you don't do this expectations up front, they don't understand the market. You go and show them homes. You write three, four, or five offers that are all rejected because they won't go up. You just wasted. I don't know, 25 hours of your life on clients and you're you're expecting the market to teach them what you could have just told them up front, up front right? You're letting the market tell them. And the worst part about that is, is your relationship goes down with your clients because they, they get frustrated. And what is the first thing they're going to do? They're going to blame you. They're like, we're not getting accepted because you're not doing your job, right? They're not going to blame themselves. They're going to blame you. So if you let the market teach them even, although the market's the one giving them harshness, they're going to blame you for that. So set expectations, establish real expectations with your clients. You understand? This is vitally important to be successful in this market. That means you and your buyer are on the same mindset about how we're going to be successful in this market. 
Now, a lot, a lot of agents skip this step, a lot of agents. And I can tell you, it's because you just wanna go home, you're excited, they're, they're pre-approved, let's go see homes. And you do nothing to accept, expect communications, expect uh, uh, how, what to expect on bidding, what to expect on offers, how quickly you want them to respond, how quickly you want them to show. Those are all very important things you wanna set up in this market. Uh, let me stop there. Is there any ahas? And who who does buyer who does buyer consults regularly on this call? Anyone? Mm, our team does. Oh, do, do you do, this Julie? Is Parm. Yeah, no, this is Parm. we all do. Yeah, well, I, I this, know, yeah, this is Julie. Right? Yeah, yeah, our whole team. Yeah, yeah. So just be aware. You know, if you're doing one, I know you have it pretty standardized, but just think you're going to have to be a little more on sync in this market to get accepted, right? Because you have to be really aggressive, right? So, and and Parm, you do that with everyone on your team is required to do that, right? So. Correct. Any buyer that we're working with, we have a Zoom consultation or, or an list, you know, if not able, then a phone consultation. We're yeah. not doing in-persons anymore. Yeah. So do you guys think you would have that kind of success if you didn't do that? <laughs> not at all. We'd be wasting more time. <laughs> yeah, wasting more time, right? So yeah. take it from team that's doing over 100 transactions a year their standard is a buyer consult with every one of their buyers right so if you want if, they, call, if they can't commit 30 minutes to 60 minutes to have a consultation then why are you committing to being their agent yeah and honestly the same as standards on my team if they're not willing to do a bar consult we don't do it right <laughs> they, they can go they know they can go waste someone else's time right so, so all right so um I recommend you want to build rapport with the showing eight with the with the listing agent. This is vitally important. I can say I could say 75% of the reason that I get offers accepted in a multiple offer situation is because I have good rapport with the listing agent. Okay. How do I do that? I before I show a home, I text the agent or call the agent and say, hey, do you have any offers? When are you presenting? I just and even if they say we're presenting on Monday, blah, 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 blah. I I, I still call and text just because I want to establish that that I'm professional. I'm 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 telling you I'm showing the home, right? <laughs> you know, those things. And often obviously with peds now, you're gonna be interacting with them anyways, right? So um, so and after the showing, if your client's interested, so I would often do this, say we're on, I'm showing four homes. Um, after home two, they really like home two, but we have two more to go. I know they really like it. Then after, on the way from to home two to home three, I, I'm on my phone, you know, hands-free in my car and I'm calling the listing agent right then. I said, hey, you know what? Hey, I know I showed my home, we just got done. My clients love the home and they want to win. Where do we need to be to win? Right. Where are you? I say, where are you, the listing agent or this? What is you? What are you, the listing agent and the seller for looking for in the offer? What do you want to see? Now, a lot of times I'll blow you off. Ah, oh, you know, just submit highest and best, uh, blah, 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 blah. How many offers you got? I got multiple offers to submit. I press them. I am persistent. I at least. I'd say over 50% of the time, I get an actual number out of that listing agent, like a number, right? Like you need to be at this high to, to win. And if not, I often get like, oh, where are your offers? Are they above, below, way above list price? And so I get a, I get a category. Yeah, we have some, they're all around list price, a little bit above list price. So if I'm, if I'm significantly above list price, I'll win. Yeah, likely. Great. Does that make sense? I know where I need to go. Does that make sense? This is vitally important that you get this. Now, a good way to start this, I say my clients want to win, compliment them on the listing. Butter them up, right? Like make your relationship good. <laughs> like, hey, that is a great listing you got, right? Congratulations. That's a great home. It shows real well, right? Or or if you know their production, hey, I, you know, that's a great listing. I see all your listings all the time, man. You're you're killing it, right? So just just congratulate them. Build that, build that rapport. That is important. Especially you want to get it. Okay. So when you're drafting and submitting an offer, talk to the agents about uh, uh, write strong offers. You know, I mean, I can't stress that enough. You got to write a strong offer. That means if you're coming in at list price, 30 day escrows with, uh, you know, uh, 
all the standard contingency timelines, you're probably going to lose, right? <laughs> so you're going to have to talk, you're going to have to write strong offers. Um, there's a couple of strategies if they have offer deadlines. So oftentimes you'll see that like, we're going to review offers on Sunday or we're going to review offers on Monday. There's two approaches I find. A lot, a lot of agents like to wait. Okay, if you're going to offer, you're going to review on Sunday, they submit an offer Sunday morning and, and hope they win, right? If I'm Friday, so example, say I show the home on Friday, they're going to review offers on Sunday. I, I like the bully approach. That means I tell my clients, hey, I want to bully other offers. That means I want to go in Friday night and I want to set the standard for the listing agent. When other agents call them and says, hey, how, I, how, do you have offers? Yeah. Where do I need to be when? If they ask that question, I want them to say a number that scares their buyers. <laughs> I've done this quite successfully where my buyers, okay, yeah, we want the house. Let's go in aggressive. So I'm going 15,000 over list price or 20,000 over list price. I'm doing short contingencies. I'm doing all those things the sellers and the listing agent asked me to do. And I give it to them Friday because everyone who calls them, it will diminish the multiple offers they get. It will diminish the amount of offers they get over time if you come up with strong way before the list price, before people start calling and offering other times, right? But you can't do that without your clients on board. If your buyers aren't on board, they can't do that, right? So, <laughs> got it? Everyone good? John? Yeah. I have a quick question. Yes. Okay, so let's say, you know, we go like 10,000, 15,000 over the listing price. Uh -huh. And you know, later on, if it doesn't appraise, then what should we do? I'll get to that. We're going to talk about appraisal guarantees. So, okay, we'll thank that. you. So, um, just writing strong offers. Obviously, the price matters. Um, EMDs matter. You'd be surprised how much EMDs matter. Like, put a three percent EMD. If your buyers have, are putting twenty percent down, put the EMD up to three percent. You'll be surprised how strong that makes your offer look. If you're putting twenty thousand dollar EMD down, does it make sense? So. Um, just EMD matters. So if your buyers have the ability to put a strong EMD in there, I'd often do that, especially if you're competing for multiple offers. It makes your offer stand out. Obviously, you want shorter close of escrows. Now, for those of you with lenders and you can't compete, and um, I see a lot of issues with lenders, right? Make sure your lender's on board if you're going to write shorter. The loan lenders also can do what we call a TBD approval. That means they fully underwrite your your they fully underwrite you your buyer minus the home. So what happens is they can go shopping. All they really need is an appraisal and maybe some updated docs, and they can close. And often your lender can close shorter than that if they do that, like 21 days, 17 day close. If they do a TBD approval. Now the problem with that is it takes your buyers longer to get pre-approved because they got to run through escrow. I mean, run through uh, underwriting. That means instead of just pre-approving them. They're actually going to run them all the way through underwriting. That means an underwriter is going to look at their finances and judge them if they're pre-approved for a loan. Does that make sense? But then you can write more sexy offers. You can compete with cash ones. I'll close in 17 days. You can waive the loan contingency because you already know they're approved. So you're now waiving the loan contingency. All I got is a short appraisal and I got a short loan uh, inspection contingency. You can run those inspections. You want shorter contingencies, right? 10-day uh, inspection periods, 12-day appraisal. Make sure on the appraisal that your lender can get that appraisal done in that time. If you have to do a 17-day loan. So there's a lot of strategies you can do for that. Does that make sense? Anyone not understand what I'm talking about? All right. I'm going to go into negotiating. Uh, let's go a little bit into negotiating. Um, I like to, I like to um, if my buyers really want the home, I start trying to negotiate with the listing agent right off the bat. What does that mean? That means I call them and say, hey, where do we need to win? And they may say, oh, well, John, you know, I can tell you we have three offers already. We're expecting more. I was like, great, great, great. And I, I know when you're going to look, it says, well, I think we're going to look at them on, on Monday. I go, and then I tell them, well, what would I have to write in an offer for your sellers to say, I want to sign this tonight? What would that look like? And, and, and I really press them on it. And, and, and so I, I really try to negotiate what they want. And that way, if the listing agent gives me what they want, they're more likely to push the seller to accept that offer. 
right? So one thing I want to, you should, you should learn to be a better negotiator. This is a good time to be a good negotiator. Rule number one, this is like negotiation number one, don't negotiate with yourself. What does that mean? That means if you and your buyer are arguing about what you should offer on the house to be accepted, and you have not had a real conversation with the listing agent, you are negotiating with yourself. Does it make sense? <laughs> Don't negotiate with yourself. Negotiate with the other side. And if you're saying they're not responding, I can't, I can't do this. A lot of times I will offer, I will just offer a, uh, just a, not, not my best offer. I'll just write an offer and say, offers will oftentimes get you a response. And then I write an addendum or I submit a new offer later after I can get a conversation going. So sometimes they don't respond unless I put an offer in. So sometimes I do that to get the, get the talk going. I'm always wanting to get the talk going. Negotiate from a win-win perspective. Many newer agents make the mistake of starting every negotiation as if they're going into battle. This annoys the listing agent and it hurts your client's interest as well. Don't battle the listing agent, work with them. What does a listing agent want? What does a seller want? Anyone know? When you're selling it, you're representing a seller. What do you want? What does the seller want? To sell their home. To sell their home. Right. They want to sell their home. What do they want more than that? What, what is important about selling their home? What do they want in the offer? They want the most productive offer. Most they can get. Sometimes they want the most offer, but I've seen a lot of sellers not accept the highest offer. Why? It's not because of price. All, most of the time, it's not price. What do the seller want? Commitment. Yeah, they want certainty that it's going to close. That if I accept your offer, I can go look and go get my other house. That's in the end what they want. Now they want high price, but they won't sacrifice price for uncertainty. Does it make sense? I can write a house, I can write an offer 50,000 over that we will know will never appraise and my buyers have no cash to go above appraisal. Do you think that's a sound offer? Would they accept that offer? No, because it's a, it's a very risky offer. Does that make sense? So it's not about price. It's really about certainty. So when you think about that, that's why I tell you write offers, shorter contingencies. If you get TBD approved, less no loan contingency, the best thing you can do is give certainty. Now, the listing agent also wants certainty. They don't get paid unless it closed. The last thing they want to do is go 20 days in the escrow, have it cancel and have to relist it and do it all over again, right? And remember, what does the listing agent also want? They don't want 21 offers. If they get 21 offers, that's 21 offers they have to deal with, right? If I go in and say, I'm your offer, here you go, then they only have to deal with one offer or a few offers as opposed to 21. You want to short circuit the conversation. Does that make sense? Um, a lot of times you can make it mushy. Do the love letter from the buyers. It helps, trust me. It helps, right? So On that note, are photos still allowed, John? And what's the regulations or do you foresee any changes with that? Um, there has been, um, there is fear amongst the regulators that putting pictures in your letter allows them to racially discriminate against your clients. So, um, correct. correct. So what's your stance on that? Is it okay to still submit or do you think there could be some pushback or do you I would, think that I would say, if you're going to do that, just say, Hey, this is a concern by regulators. Um, you know, you may get discriminated against and not know it, right. You may submit in your offers. It's not accepted. You don't even know why. Right. So do you, or I, I personally, uh, and they're saying from an agent perspective, you can't encourage discrimination, right. Mm -hmm. So, but um, it's, it's a really great area. I would say, um, honestly, I, I go both ways. I tell the, I tell buyers, you know, Hey, this is a risk, but you know, I think your story matches your family well, and I think we should, and some don't. Right. So it just depends. Right. So you can't come back I, I would on say the, this, I mean, as a standard, if you can get away without doing it, then I would probably not do it. Right. So, so. Got it. so. okay. Uh, I always negotiate over the phone before writing an offer. Don't negotiate yourself. And some of the things, how do you make it win for the seller? How do you make it a win for a listing agent? How do you make it a win for your buyer? 
finding the value points that are cheap for you to ask for your buyer's value points are cheap. So a lot of times they're asking for you things that are not price related, but are easy to concede, shorter contingencies, um, guarantees about certain things. So, um, you know, you should, you should learn to be a better negotiator. In this market, um, better agents that have better negotiating skills are going to win more often. I want to tell you that right now. There's a book, The Strat New Strategy of Negotiations by Guhan. Um, it's a good book if you want to talk about negotiations. So um, this is appraisal guarantee. So I, I see a lot of people, right? Tr a lot of counter offers or, or people, and we got, and I, one agent got in trouble recently in our office, um, created some liability for their, for them, for their clients by waiving appraisals of tendencies. You can't, I, I highly, highly do not recommend you uh, waive appraisal contingencies. And if you do, there better be something in writing from you and the buyer saying, I advise against this. This is against my recommendations. And here's why you risk losing the deposit, right? Make sense? What does that mean if you don't get an appraisal waiver? That means if the appraisal comes in low. So if you're at 400,000 and you waive your appraisal, and that appraisal only comes in at 385, that means your buyer is coming with an additional 15,000 cash plus their normal down payment, plus the closing cost to close that deal. And if they don't, they could lose their deposit. Everyone clear on that? So I recommend an appraisal guarantee strategy. The buyer shall play bank above the approved value of the, sorry, it should be a, the approved, uh, above the appraised, it should be above, not approved pay above the appraised value of the home, not to exceed whatever you offer initially. So if I'm offering 420 for the house, I'm gonna say the buyer shall pay 5,000 above the approved value of the home, not to exceed 420,000. The seller agrees to change the purchase price to this value after appraisal completion. Now, a lot of agents don't write that in there. And then we get disputes and the seller says, I'm not willing to, I'm not willing to go down that low. I didn't know it was gonna be that low. I'm not willing to go down that low. Does it make sense? So if you put this second sentence in, seller agrees to change the price to this value after appraisal completion, then it puts them in writing saying they agree to go in, go in with you. Does that make sense? But this means your buyer may be out additional cash. That means whatever number you put in there above their down payment, above their closing costs, are going to have to put additional money to close that deal. But I've used appraisal guarantees a, a lot to get offers accepted in multiple offer situations because it adds more certainty to the seller, All right? So this is a way to write around, that. You know, I'd put this on an addendum to the contract. This is a good way to write around waiving the appraisal contingency. So if oftentimes you offer and they counter with an, a wave of appraisal contingency, I counter back with an appraisal guarantee thing. And if I lose because there's another buyer, buyer or another agent that is poor and willing to waive the appraisal guarantee, then then that's up to them, right? I, I don't I don't do that. So, um, any questions on this? There's a lot of no, no questions. All right. Who, has do anyone really, used appraisal guarantees? Do you really need um and something in writing when you've had a conversation with a client about what an appraisal waiver is because they're signing it on the contract and you're kind of explaining to them and then it's kind of contradictory tell if you're telling someone like hey this is you know what an appraisal waiver means here's the risks but here's the opportunity of your offer getting accepted here's the comps so are we supposed to have to send i would at least if, if you were going to do that then i would at least send a market a market advisory with them. So the market advisory says uh, the risk of waiving appraisal uh, inspection, the importance of contingencies, the risk of waiving these contingencies, and you're going against the broker's recommendation if you do. That's what the, the market advisory does, right? So I would submit that offer if you're going in with a lot of waived contingencies. And the reason is this, for example, here's, you're right, it's in writing, but here's what happens. Say you put in a deposit, your buyers, the appraisal comes in low. Your buyers actually don't have the money. Now they're now the seller's pissed off. You can't close the deal, and and now we're in dispute over the deposit, right? Imagine we go to small claims court, or say now we're in dispute. Seller ends up suing the buyers for the deposit. Mm -hmm. 
what do you think the buy, what do you think the buyers are going to do at that point? Yeah, not be happy. Yeah, they're not going to be happy. They're going to go like, back. "Hey, Parm, you messed up. You put mm -hmm. me in this situation. I'm suing you for the money or pay the money off." Right. right. <laughs> That's what but they're going to say. Right. Let me ask you this also, though: if you're doing an appraisal waiver, but you still have a loan contingency in place, this is really going to impact you if you haven't run your comps, right? And if you're sure. advising just doing a highest and best offer when you don't feel it's going to appraise. Right. Yeah. So if you do it correctly, the right way, it shouldn't come to bite you in the butt. But if for some reason, let's say, for example, the buyer says, you know what, I'm willing to pay, you know, this and I know my um, loan approval is this, but I have 10K sitting there. Right. But yeah. now let's say the shortage is 12 and they don't have those funds, then technically can't they get out based on their loan contingency because they don't have the funds to get the loan. Right. And. And um, I can pull it up here, but if you read the loan contingency, actually go in the contract and read the loan contingency, mm -hmm. it says cost to close this loan, money to close this loan is not part of this contingency. And it even says um, if the appraisal contingency is waived and the buyer has insufficient funds to close the loan, they cannot cancel on loan contingency. So it literally says that in the loan contingency so cash to close, any amount of money that you're claiming to close is not a contingency of the contract. So if the loan is denied because the buyer has insufficient cash, you cannot cancel the loan contingency legally. You can only cancel if they're denied the loan for other reasons. So, and that's written into the contract. So that's why. So I've had people be cute about that. I've had on listings, people come to me and says, appraisal guarantee, and they're like, ha 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 you know, we still have the loan contingency in place. And I go here, read it. I was like, oh crap. I was like, if you cancel, on, if you cancel on, and you can actually, I, I can go to the lender and says, you're, if you lied to me about how you canceled, because they actually have a formal process. There's a legal government process that they have to issue a literally a formal response on the why they canceled. And if they say yeah. insufficient funds from the buyer, boom, they can't cancel you owe us the deposit. Right. So, yeah, they have to issue a cancellation. Letter. Yeah, they have to issue okay. a cancellation. Right. And, and if I'm the seller and I think that's the reason or I'm the listing agent, then I'm going to push it. I want to I want to see the formal cancellation reason from the lender. Right. So. So just know that your appraisal guarantee is a way to do it. But Parm is right. Make sure you comp your homes. Right. If the home is really nice, the appraiser will probably give you a little bump over list price because they know the market if it's just close to value. But if you're like way off value, you're going to have an appraisal issue. Does that make sense? So um, escalation clause. This is this has uh, been a strategy that not many people use. But I've seen Francine, it used I'm it. sorry. It's Francine. I have yeah. a quick question. Yeah. So if I'm understanding this correctly, I'll give you an example. Yeah. I'm writing an offer right now for a home down in, in uh, Discovery Bay. Okay. It's at four hundred seventy-five thousand. The we have been getting beat out in Antioch, Brentwood, Discovery Bay for like the last two weeks. Okay. Offers have been going twenty-five thousand over, thirty thousand over. Right. And so we're writing this one. Um, it's at four seventy-five list price. We're writing it at five hundred thousand. Mm -hmm. um, I did the comps. Huh? Probably the comps are the comps are coming in at 490, 505. Okay. 45, 505, maybe, yeah. depending on the condition. Uh -huh. Um, the condition of the home in Discovery Bay, okay. <clears throat> which are not very many homes for sale, by the way. Yeah. And um, so should I include this appraisal guarantee strategy? I mean, I'm concerned now that what if it doesn't appraise? Right. It's gonna tank the offer, right? So, well, if it doesn't appraise, if they accept the offer and it doesn't appraise, say it comes in at 490, do the sellers have to accept that 490 appraisal fee? Appraisal? No. 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 They can say bring cash or cancel. Uh huh. Okay. Right. So there's no guarantee. If you use this language, then they lock it in. So say it comes in at 490. Great. I'll give you 495 done for closing. Oh, really? Yeah, so say your example, say you wrote this in as a 5,000 appraisal guarantee. Okay. You write it off $500, $500,000 offer on the 475 house. It appraises at 490, right? Right. And automatically it says, great, you're getting, seller, you have to come down five, but I'm putting out five under our scenario, you're at 495. Are the sellers going to balk at four, uh, at, at 
on a pre-agreed price. So it, it really puts both your skins in the game. It, to the seller, it's a perception that they they get a guarantee, which they like, but it really it locks it locks the contract in, even if appraisal is low, which is nice, right? Okay, so but the only the only thing about that then is the kids have to come in with an extra five thousand in cash. Correct. So uh -huh. I tell I tell I have that, and that's a conversation you have to have between your lender, yourself, and the buyers. Like, do they have additional cash? above and beyond down payment, closing costs. And just so you know, I've actually played with this a lot. Work with your lender. I've had people who had this situation where we're, we want to do appraisal guarantee, it's, it's you know, kind of thing, and they don't have the cash. They have enough cash for the down payment closing costs. And I tell them, hey, right now rates are so freaking low. For example, I had a buyer, they're at, they were quoted at 2.125%, right? I should say my team had a buyer, 2.125%, great credit, he had enough cash to close, but didn't have a whole bunch of much more than that. We were trying to get appraisal guarantee, get it in there. And I went to the lender and said, hey, what, what happens? What credit lender credit are you going to get if you bump it from 2.125 to two and, a, two and a quarter? Only one eighth up, right? Right. He, he was going to, the buyer was going to get a $4,800 credit if they did that. So I said, hey, on this offer, what if you accepted a loan at 2.25, your payment would go up $18 a month? or it's not even that it was like $12 a month or something. Right? It wasn't that much. And, and now we have 5,000 to play with because now instead of being 5,000 to close your deal, the lender credits playing your closing costs and I can use the 5,000 for your appraisal guarantee. Right. Uh -huh. But okay. if the, if it appraises, don't worry, we'll just do what you normally were doing. If it doesn't appraise and the appraisal guarantee kicks in, we're going to have to do the lender credit and fix it that way. Does it make sense? So, it does. so sometimes you can manufacture the money out of the loan too, if you try. Right. So, okay. Okay, cool. Thank you. Any other questions about this? So appraisal guarantees are very popular right now. If you're not writing them and are not using them, you're probably going to have less success. They're very popular right now. But make sure your buyer understands what they are. They have the cash or have a way to get the cash if they need it. All right. So. Um, escalation clause. This is for your very aggressive buyers that have some, some net worth to them. You can put a clause in the contract that says buyers are willing to play blank higher than the highest written offer received by the seller not to exceed blank. So you can put a top end on this. So Francine's situation, buyers are willing to pay 5,000 higher than the highest written offer received by the seller not to exceed $505,000. Does that make sense or something like that? <laughs> a copy of the highest written offer to be sent along with the acceptance of this offer and addendum. Does that make sense? Now, some listing agents don't like this because they're old school and they feel it's unfair. That's not fair, you know, yada, yada, yada. Some agents don't care. So I'd recommend before you do this, talk to the listing agent because some people will not like it and feel it's unfair and they'll, they'll poo poo your offer. So just make sure you check with listing agents before doing an escalation clause. But your buyers have to really want the house. That means they're gonna, they're gonna spend what they need to to get that house. So these are for your super desperate buyers that have a little money and they're willing to go it. Make sense? Any questions? No. Um, loose offer has a limit opportunity. Okay, so sometimes you see houses that are overpriced. Who sees houses that are overpriced? <laughs> All the time. If you have a offer that's overpriced, sometimes you can do what I call loose offer strategy. I've done this once or twice, but um, where I say, hey, your home's listed at 600,000, but it's been sitting on the market for a while, but it's really because it's lower 500s to get the home, but the seller is hard and the listing agent says, the seller is difficult. He really wants this price, I understand. And a lot of times I will give him a long escrow and I'll say, hey, I'll come in at the lower price, your seller accepts, but I'll let him market the house for additional 30 days. In the meantime, I'll do inspections. An appraisal and if 30 days pass and you don't get a higher offer then you accept my value sometimes that's a way to get a house for your buyer where the seller is stuck on a high price that's unrealistic questions on those um always the price of home is not the list price overpriced listing the listing agreement seller is holding firm so if you want if you're offering anything lowball or ver even verbally and they, they're going to reject it. You want to make a deal. What does the seller want? So a lot of times I'll go, Hey, uh, I know your home is listed at, at 500. I, I, you know, I want to, 
you know, I, I, it's really high. I think, you know, that's why you've been on the market a little bit. I want to offer, uh, we want to offer 475. And then what is the listing agent going to say? Oh man, don't worry. The sellers already rejected other offers for that. Um, they wouldn't, he wouldn't come down for that. I know it's unrealistic. I'm trying to work on them. I great, great. Well, what, what do we have to offer to get a response? And then oftentimes I'll say, oh, you know, we had another offer. They went up to 480 and the seller rejected it, but I think he'll, I think he'll do 480 now. And then they give you a number. <laughs> and they give you a number that the seller, that they think the seller will do. And that's called price anchoring, that you can start low and try to get the real number from the seller, from the listing agent on what actually the price is of the home. That's another way to get knowledge of what the other side is, so. This is a controversial one. Oftentimes you'll have agents that are non response who, who submits offers and doesn't get responses from the agent right away or they're slow to respond or you don't know if there's multiple offers and yada, 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 yada. I've seen that a lot. So a lot of times if the seller is occupying the home, I write the offer and then I schedule another showing at the home and if I know the sellers are living in the home, but I show up to the, I show up with the seller, I mean, with the buyers early to the showing where the sellers are still in the home. Does that make sense? And I talk with the seller about our offer. Now, this might piss off your listing agent, so just FYI. But if your listing agent is being non-responsive or you think they're trying to double-end it or they're trying to push something past you, this is a, going to the seller directly as a way, or even if, um, um, even if the seller, you make an appointment with the seller to see the home, um, not which we're not doing a lot on COVID now, but if you did or had the seller's contact information, you can contact them and say, hey, we want to arrange another showing. By the way, did you receive our offer, right? And then you trigger something, some conversations with the seller at that point, right? This is really good if the listing agent is lazy or just ghosting you, these, this strategy, right? I just so you know, it will be a little controversial, but it's, it, it can be highly effective. <laughs> so I can just let you know. Get the listing agent on your side strategy. I, I would recommend this a lot. When you're offering, when I do the negotiations with the agent, I try to do it over the phone. I try to do it verbally even before we write the offer. So oftentimes I'll say, hey, where do we need to be? Well, we got three offers. We're expecting some more. Um, you know, and I ask them, well, can you tell me where we need to be to win? And they're like, well, you know, uh, you know, you just write your highest and best. And I say, well, you know, I really want my buyers to win. Um, just so you know, you know, I, I'm a good agent. I can manage my buyers. My buyers really want the home. I want to give an offer that your seller and you, that you are comfortable presenting to your offer to your sellers tonight that they would likely sign. What does that offer look like? And I start pushing and pushing and pushing. And oftentimes I'll say, well, I have offers a little bit over this price. So if I was 10,000 or 15,000 over list price, would that be very nice for your sellers and something they'd be very excited about? Yeah, that would be pretty good. Great, right? So I get the listing agent on my side. I get them to tell me what they want. So when you're asking for an offer that you'll know be sticking point. So if you're asking for things in the offer that's a sticking point, like a seller credit or something, Make sure that, or something in the offer that's weird, make sure the seller, the listing agent is okay with it. Because if the listing agent is okay with it, that term, they're likely going to present it better to the, to the seller, to the seller. So this is, for example, especially if you're working on a credit on it for a buyer for repairs, it's a good thing to start getting your, to have a conversation with your listing agent over the times and the reports to get your listing agent on board with your credit ask. Because if they if they present it to the seller as something that is expected and normal, you're much more likely to get accepted on that credit. That's sort of a negotiation tactic. I want you to, this is, this is about escrow and I wanna just talk about leverage a little bit. Understand that seller and buyer leverage changes during escrow. So if you have, say you're worried about appraisal as a lot of us are, right? You offered over, you're accepted, you're worried about appraisal coming in. You comped it, it's probably five to 10,000 over comps and you're hoping your, your, your appraiser comes in at value, right? But it may not. Does that make sense? Now, what, what would I do on that? How would I handle that escrow? 
Now you got to understand what happens. Now we have day one of escrow and day 30 of escrow. What happens? Who has most control at day one? Day zero, before offer is accepted, who has control in our market right now? Anyone? Who has more leverage? The seller. The seller, yeah. The seller has more leverage, right? Because they got multiple offers. It's a seller's market, right? They got most control. Now, if we go to day 30, we're about to close. Who has more leverage? Buyer. The buyer, why? The seller doesn't want it to fall out. Yeah, the seller doesn't want to fall out. They're, if we're at day 30, they already moved out, likely. <laughs> they're in their other home. They have two homes that are floating now, right? They, they, they need to get rid of it. They don't want to put it back on the market and go another 30 days. So understand over the life of a contract, it starts in our market, it starts high on the seller, but it does translate down to the buyer side where it's buyer heavy leverage by the end of the contract. So understand that as an agent. If I'm worried about appraisal, what happens if I get a 17-day appraisal contingency in the contract? And for some reason, I also get, a, a, or here's what happens. I get a 12-day inspection contingency. I get a 17-day appraisal contingency. I get a 21-day loan contingency accepted in the contract. Day 12, I go to the sellers and um, I present a, a request for repair and I ask for $5,000. And what happens? They kind of, they're slow to respond. They're waiting, yada, yada. They're worried about appraisal too. So they milk it until the appraisal comes in. Appraisal comes in. It's 5,000 low. Now what do they do? Anyone know? They lump everything together. Does that make sense? That means they're going to say, they're going to put your repairs and your appraisal shortage together in negotiations. They're not going to say, well, I'll give you five and five here. They're not going to say, well, I was going to give you five for your repairs, but I have to come find out as an appraisal. I'm just going to do that zero on the repairs. Does that make sense? <laughs> now, the trick for as a buyer's agent, for savvy about it, think about it. I would want, I would hustle the inspections. I would get inspections there day two. I would have my reports on day three. And by the end of day three, I would have a, a request for repair in the seller's hands right then. Because I want it negotiated and in writing done first before we even think about the appraisal. That way is if they give me five here and now we're 17, 20 days into escrow and I got to ask them for another five for the appraisal shortage. Now I have more leverage when I have to ask them again. <laughs> I have more leverage because I'm day 20 of the contract and the person are, and the seller has already arranged for their new home and they've already arranged the movers and they've already bought the boxes and things. <laughs> Does that make sense? Like they're already out the door. And while it's painful, I have more leverage then. So you can time your, you can time your things. Th so be smart about your contracts, right? Structure, structure inspections and appraisal. If you walk a home, you're like, man, there's going to be some issues with this home. My buyer ex is going to expect some, some repairs. And I, and I may have an appraisal issue, separate them. If you put them together, now you're going to have a much more likely chance that the deal falls apart or that your buyers get much less money, right? <laughs> sense? So just understand, especially if the listing agent is lazy or inexperienced, they won't watch deadlines. They won't watch deadlines. So oftentimes I'm pushing things past contingencies because they're not asking me. <laughs> they're say, hey, contingencies do. So... I use lazy and experience. If, if there's an agent on the side, on the buy side, and it gives me more leverage to delay, to get them information, then I delay. Because if I know I have a hard ask, the longer I go, the better chance I'm going to get that hard ask accepted. <laughs> Make sense? So questions? Yeah, John, what happens when the listing agent won't respond to your request for repairs because they tell you they want to wait until the appraisal comes back? That is a savvy listing agent. The contract states they are not required to respond to your request for repairs. Yeah. So you just kind of have to wait. So I would threaten, I, if I were a buyer's agent, I would, I would threaten cancellation. I would say, hey, look, our contingency, usually you're writing your contingency shorter for your inspections than your, than your appraisal, right? Yeah. Right? So then I would say this. I was like, look, I, I'm a professional. I honor our deadlines. 
Um, either we're going to cancel because our inspection contingency is up in two days, or are you going to give me an ex extension on my inspection contingency to the appraisal contingency? That means you're asking the seller to give you more time and, a, and another reason to cancel 17 days into the contract, right? So it sort of puts them in there like, hey, I'm going to, like I stickler, I don't want to hold this contingency open. If you, you said 10 days, we want to honor 10 days. Um, we want a response or we can cancel, right? And move on. And sometimes, you know, it just depends. Now that depends if your seller wants to go there, right? So, but, but they don't have to respond and they can hold it. And some savvy listing agents do that, but that's why, that's why I try to get them way early, right? I try to get it like day three to them. <laughs> Across the rather than because if you're close to the appraisal, the, the, the listing agent may hold it off, right? I want to get it way early in the contract, right? So, any questions, ahas, things like that? Hello, any other things you guys are seeing out there? Any things you guys are doing out there to find success in the real world? Um, the strategy is good. of submitting the RR, getting the negotiation and being prepared for the big ask if there's an appraisal issue or whatnot. Yeah. But at the end of the day, if the listing agent says, okay, yeah, we agreed to repairs and now you're asking for this because of the appraisal, we've had it where to save a deal, the request for repairs were goes renegotiated. Away, right? yeah. It goes away to help offset the appraisal gap. Yeah, but so at least- I just, yeah, at least I mean, we try. In the world where that happens a lot, yes. I agree. So but at we least did put it. Deal, right? Yes, so, exactly. Yeah. So I mean, just letting everybody know that way, no one's like thinking, "Oh, this is a done deal." It's great to have that negotiated, as John said, yeah. because at least it gives you leverage because the seller committed to something, yeah. and it's easier to tell the buyer, "Hey, we got this commitment, but now this is more important, so let's go with this." Yeah, exactly. So it gives you a tool, right, to negotiate, which is better. Yeah, and two, if you can, you can do, you can do the. Um, quick inspections and stuff like that with an appraisal guarantee as well. So you may have the five line negotiated, but the sellers already agreed to reduce price if it comes in low, right? So you can have both in place if you want at the same contract. And that sort of mitigates their ability. Now it may still cause issues at the end. You may have to compromise a little bit, but it also it also controls the situation better, right? So in today's market, it's something you have to do. Like all these tips and tricks you've been stating, you know, on the strong end. Guys, you know, we've all ran into this where there's enough buyers and there's not enough sellers to where we're in multiple offers. So you definitely have to go strong and definitely talk to your client up front because otherwise you won't get the house. And like John said, you're going to spend 25 hours later looking at homes and not getting the right advice. Yeah. And I tell this in this market right now, if you submit an offer to the listing agent and you're not hearing anything, you're not in conversation with them, you're going to lose. Pretty much tell you that. <laughs> like, Easily said. That's all. You're gonna you're gonna lose if you're not if you're not getting phone calls back or talking to listening to you are losing. Like you are not gonna win. So you gotta get in. You gotta get in rapport. Your your buyers gotta be. And I know Jose, you guys manage them well. You gotta manage your buyers well. They gotta understand what they need to do to win, right? And then your job yeah, was, is just to find them a home that they love so much that they're willing to do that, right? I told that I go, well, my job is to find you a home that you want to, you'll write anything to get that home. Does it make sense? That's what you want. <laughs> right? I jokingly say, you know, it takes five seconds to build a rapport with our buyers. At the same time, it takes five seconds to build a rapport with the listing agent. Because definitely you have to have that rapport. Yeah, you definitely have to have that rapport. And that's why I, you say, I, I, I put on there, you know, strategies for get your offer accepted. I can say most of it is having good rapport with your buyers and good understanding and having good rapport with the listing agent and negotiating with them ahead of time. Because if I'm always saying I want to win, I can I can help you get the way. What does it tell the listing? It tells them you're professional. It tells them you can manage your buyers. What do they want? They want certainty too. They want a good agent on the other side. If you're a listing agent, one of the worst things you can have is a bad agent on the other side, right? <laughs> so what they're looking for is a good agent. And if you show up well to them, they're like, man, I want to work with this person because I know we're going to get it closed, right? They can manage their buyers well. They, their buyers are realistic then that's when they start working with you, right? So any other questions? Um, make sure you work with your lender too. That's very big. I, I want to stress that. Your lender can be a big help, especially when your buyer is tight on money, right? For the right house with a lender credit, sometimes you can make things work as long as the, you know, the lender is not being super greedy on the stuff, right? But <laughs> usually you can make it work. So um, 
just make sure a lot of you, all they're approved, they're approved to 400 and you sort of think you're stuck there. Like I work with the buyer and the lender to make sure I understand how much cash they really have, what they're trying to do, what they can do, right? So any other people, I mean, some more experience, Parm or Francine, anyone here that has other, other ideas, other strategies they're using, so. Um, I have a question, John. Yeah, yeah. So I submitted a request to repair um, like three days ago. And yesterday the listing agent texted me said that the sellers did not want to make repairs, but are willing to um, give a credit for some of the repairs. Okay. But I haven't heard, I haven't, I told him to send everything via email, um, but I haven't heard back from him yet. So do you think he's, you know, pulling like that silent treatment? <laughs> No, I think he's just lazy. So, um, <laughs> so what I would recommend and talk to Amy, your coach about this, but I would, rec I would just go to him. Fine. I, I would set the number because right now they're trying to think of a number. Don't let them control the negotiations. Right. I would set the number. So okay. I would go to them. I would change my request for repair. Say, I just want to, I just do an addendum. We want to credit for it in lieu of the repairs. We're ready to release the inspection contingencies. We want this much money. Set the tone, right? That's what I would recommend. Okay. A so lot of agents. A and I'm going to just let you guys know this. Most of the problems I have, I get as a broker on issues is, is agents, not the other agent is lazy, not responding. And, and suddenly we're now day, you know, day 28 in the contract and everything's blowing up because no one had a conversation. Don't wait for the other side. If they're lazy, do their job for them, control the negotiation. The more lazy they are, if the lazy other side is lazy, I like it. Cause then I control the control. I can control things, right? I can dictate how I want things happening and I can move the transaction forward myself and I control it. That means I make it happen. So control it. Oh, okay. one other thing I want you to know on the appraisal issues, remember FHA and VA appraisal stick to the property for 180 days. So if your buyers I mean, if your buyers are doing FHA VA loan, when you're negotiating an appraisal issue, just know when they, if they're going back on the market, they can't take your offer again because they're stuck with that low appraisal. And legally, they're supposed to disclose the low appraisal in, a future, in future offers. Not that they wouldn't, but I would almost always, if it's a low appraisal, I automatically send it to the listing agent because I want them to have that, at least that legal requirement that you know you have to disclose this in future offers. So that means they're going to go for a higher offer, but they have to disclose an appraisal that said the house is not worth that, right? So it really handcuffs them. It's a good way, if you have an FHA or VA loan and you're having an appraisal issue, it's a good way to leverage the other side to accept your reduction in price. All right. Well, it's a little bit past two. Any questions? I appreciate you guys joining us. So thank you. Um, if there's any questions, I can take them online, but uh, thank you for all your time. And I uh, hope this was helpful to you. I will say everything I sort of taught you, the more you do it, the buyers, the sellers, all that, think of it as, don't think of it as just individual strategies. Think of it as a process. If I do this process with every one of my buyers, I'm going to be much more highly successful overall. That means my acceptance rates on my contracts go from 25% to 50%. How would you like to be 50% of acceptance on your offers instead of 25%, right? Does that make sense? Or maybe 10%, 10% to 30%. Well, at least I'm not wasting as much time, right? So I'm, saying, I'm not gonna say it's gonna be foolproof, but it will, it will um, improve your success rate, which is really what we're looking for, right? All right, thank you everyone. Have a great day. I appreciate you guys all turning, tuning in on this December and um, go, go out there and kill it. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, John. Thank you, Leon. Thank you, Shirley, Pat, Lindsay, all of you, whole farm team, Hemant. Thank you, guys.